New U.S. sanctions on Iran took effect today. Six months after President Trump pulled the U.S. out of the international nuclear deal. The sanctions targeted Iran's shipping, financial, and energy sectors, all key to the country's already struggling economy. The bombs, which the FBI referred to as improvised explosive devices, were sent to the FBI's bomb laboratory in Quantico, Virginia. We're in Mexico again tonight as thousands of migrants try to find a faster way to the U.S. border. The White House says it's now getting help from the Mexican government. Breaking news out of Pittsburgh, the man accused in the shooting at the uh, synagogue in Pittsburgh is pleading not guilty, and he also wants a jury trial because he's facing a 44 count. So in the final seconds before the Boeing 737 MAX crashed into the water, it was traveling at more than 500 kilometers an hour. All 189 people on board were killed. You've now entered the House of Mystery. Crime, conspiracy, history, and science. With your hosts, Al Warren, Mike Brown, Julie Saab, Michael Butterfield, Dr. Joseph Usinski, and Michael Hawley. Heard on KCAA 106.5 FM Los Angeles, 102.3 FM Riverside, and 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Okay, we're back now, and uh, joining us is Thomas Horn. What brought you into the whole Zodiac Killer area? Well, career-wise, I've been in publishing for over 25 years now, and the last few years I've also started teaching. I teach uh, reading and writing at the college level, all different levels, everything from freshman comp to textbook writing. Um, I've worked in the textbook industry. I've, I've worked in journalism. And like a lot of people, uh, I do read uh, some of the, the true crime books, you know, especially the unsolved stuff like Jack the Ripper and the Zodiac Killer. And um, a few years ago, these original police department files from the original murder cases, the FBI file available uh, to the public, not officially, but they've all leaked out onto the Internet. So... Uh, it's, this is a unique opportunity in true crime history. We can all read these documents for ourselves. We can draw our own conclusions about these murder cases and about these letters. And I was particularly interested in this because you have what we think of as the Zodiac Killer is almost exclusively this person, this, this character, writing letters to the San Francisco Chronicle and a couple other newspapers. And supposedly that would give us a glimpse into the mind of this person, get first-hand information about the killings. And these letters were written in response to articles in the papers about these murders. So it, it overlaps my field of expertise, reading and writing. So, it, you know, it interested me on both of those levels. It's true crime, it's a famous unsolved case, but it's also a unique opportunity to study what is apparently uh, uh, a serial killer corresponding with and responding to newspaper articles, and then the newspapers respond to his letters. Uh, so uh, altogether, I thought this was a really fascinating opportunity. Yeah. So so what was the um, – so for the people listening that are n not sure with the details, I mean, I think most people know the Zodiac Killer, at least the, the name and, and that, but they might not know. What's kind of the basic history and the deaths associated with Zodiac Originally, there were uh, some uh, supposedly couples. Sometimes they were couples, sometimes they weren't. December of 1968, a high school couple, David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen, uh, were out on their first date. It was a very, you know, they were a very sweet couple. They were really nice, clean-cut kids. Went out on their first date, and they ended up being shot to death uh, on, a, on a country highway on, parked alongside of the road. And a few months later, uh, a young woman named Darlene Farron and a young man named Mike Mijot were sitting in a parked car uh, in the parking lot of Blue Rock Springs Park a few miles closer to town along that same highway. They were also shot. Uh, the boy survived. Mike Mijot survived. There was immediate speculation in the newspapers that these killings might have been related. Now, the context of this is there's a, a wave of crime. These are small towns small industrial towns, small factory towns uh, on the North Bay, North San Francisco Bay Area, and there'd been a terrible wave of drug-related violence. There'd been a, uh, Darlene Farron was the 10th uh, 
fatal shooting victim in nine months in Vallejo. Vallejo was a town of about 80,000 people. So there had been this terrible wave of violence, most of it drug-related, and so the public, right, there's kind of a different sympathy for the victims of drug-related violence. The, the teenage couple were apparently very clean-cut kids, so this seemed to be something completely different. And then at first, the media coverage of Darlene and Mike uh, and what they might have been doing at the park when they got shot, they tried to kind of lump these cases together in the media. And someone kind of took their cue from that and about a month later started writing letters to the San Francisco Chronicles, taking credit for these murders and then some subsequent murders that happened. A couple years later, an investigative reporter named Paul Avery thought he had discovered a link between these murders and the unsolved murder of another college girl uh, named Sherry Jo Bates uh, in Riverside, California in the fall of 1966. But there's considerable doubt, especially when we look at these documents ourselves, that there was any real connection between those murders. So you have a public uh, perception of these murders. And there were a few police officers who kind of bought into this, apparently, uh, that there was a connection between these murders. The idea the serial killer was kind of new, that apparently unrelated murders might actually be connected somehow. And then you have someone writing letters to the newspapers, not to the police, to these newspapers, especially the Chronicle, saying, yeah, these, yeah, these murders are connected. I did them, making threats, right, uh, threatening to uh, take out a school bus full of kids, threatening to drive around in the night and to shoot up random couples or lonely people, um, threatening to plant roadside bombs. And so this became a real sensational story because supposedly we're getting communication directly from this criminal genius. Right. You know, what do you think um, made the Zodiac killing so unique? It wasn't really unique. There had been this very successful and very profitable story of the Boston Strangler, which is a very similar situation. You had uh, what looks like to be three separate serial killers uh, strangling women in the Boston area, but they had distinctively different MOs. One of them turns out to have been Albert DeSalvo. He had confessed to committing all the murders, but there are pretty big holes in a lot of his confessions. But the last few victims, the younger, prettier victims, um, apparently DeSalvo, who was a compulsive rapist, he had sort of sort of copycatting this highly publicized uh, Boston Strangler. And part of the Boston Strangler myth was that the different police departments in the Boston metropolitan area were not cooperating very effectively, uh, things like this. So you had a best-selling book by Gerald Franck, which is actually pretty good work of, of true crime and investigative journalism. Uh, and then that was made into a highly fictionalized movie starring Tony uh, Tony Curtis and Henry Fonda, um, terribly fictionalized movie. And what's interesting is when you read Graysmith's book, Zodiac, you can tell he used the movie version of the Boston Strangler really as his model for how he structures his book and how he presents his suspects and things. This movie was playing, it was still playing, you know, it was a blockbuster hit. It was still playing in theaters the night that, that David and Betty Lou were shot. So it really doesn't, it's not really unique. Uh, it, it, and the media coverage borrows the tried and true elements of unsolved murder cases and, and questions about why police are having such a hard time finding this killer. But you throw into it, the killer's actually writing letters to the paper, uh, including he, he gets the audience involved in very clever ways. He, he demands that the papers publish these, uh, these cryptograms, these, these coded messages on the front page of their paper, and he gets the audience involved in breaking these cryptograms, uh, pretty clever marketing idea uh, in retrospect. And, and, and it worked. Uh, a, a couple of uh, readers uh, did uh, solve, the uh, uh, high school teacher and his wife did solve uh, the first cipher message. Hmm. So, yeah, I guess, I guess the flavor back then, too, of the, of the times, you know, of, of the Boston Strangler, and plus there must have been a lot of pressure to try and solve the idea of, of a serial killer, right? So, Well, one of the key investigators, and he kind of got the ball rolling on this hysteria, was named Mel Nikolai. He was an agent with the California Department of Justice. And he'd attended a seminar uh, hosted by the FBI in uh, getting the word out that you might, have, you might have some unsolved murders in your area that don't look connected, but if you look a little, you know, double check, and you might notice the same weapon or same victim profile or something. 
uh, to kind of keep your eyes open. And he was really active uh, in, in promoting this idea, or at least getting the, the police departments to look into the possibility that these murders might be connected. And, and, and there was kind of a power of suggestion there. And he really seems to have gotten carried away with the idea. Uh, and, and so some of the media coverage and some of the some of the investigators thought that there might be a Zodiac killer. Most of them were not convinced, but he did apparently uh, succeed in convincing some of the investigators they were looking for a serial killer, or at least possibly looking for a serial killer. Who so, they, and, oh, sorry, keep going. Well, and, and 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 this was kind of the first. You had the Boston Strangler, and then right on the heels of that, you get this Zodiac killer, really popularizing the idea in the minds of the public that there'd be even the Boston Strangler. The, the, in the three individual Boston Stranglers, they had very specific tastes in victims. The Zodiac Killer was sort of kind of, he was branching out, and, and really anyone could be a victim, and that was something that also uh, kind of sold a lot in newspapers, was that you just never had, you couldn't tell who the next victim was going to be. Yeah. I was just going to say, so who did they have as the prime suspect, or did they have one? At the time, they didn't have any. Um... There were no suspects, serious suspects. The suspects that Grace Smith talks about in his books were not. They're jokes when, it, you know, as suspects. Um, there was one, one police officer in Vallejo had investigated this, this fellow named Arthur Lee Allen on charges of molesting uh, children at a school where he worked. And this is, these are very credible allegations. He was later convicted of doing this kind of stuff. Um, and when the when the third attack happened, the two kids were stabbed at Lake Berryessa. Um, one of these pop culture psychologists diagnosed a Zodiac killer as being a repressed latent homosexual and probable child molester. And Mol a light kind of went off in Mullinex's head because he he knew about Alan's uh, uh, psychological problems, and he also knew that Alan spent a lot of time at Lake Berryessa. He knew that he right he owned several different cars, and he lived with his mom, and, and he. He kind of fit the vague descriptions that they had uh, of the assailant, and so for, you know it's reasonable. You can see from Mullinax's point of view why he would he would think of Alan, and he kind of went around trying to convince people. And then uh, later on, one of Alan's uh, acquaintances, uh, a friend of Alan's brother, uh, this um, this uh, not Dick Cheney. Uh, <laughs> uh, the name will come to me in a second. Sorry. Uh, I'm not going to touch that one. <laughs> not, not Dick Cheney, but uh, it was a friend of uh, Alan who, who uh, he accused Alan of trying to molest his kids, which was probably true. And so he also kind of, he and Mullinax would kind of bombard police departments with tips, right, that look at Alan, look at Alan, look at Alan. Um, most of the frame around Alan that Grace Smith provided is, is complete baloney. Um and there's, it's interesting to read some of these these documents that weren't published before, and then read them against Grace Smith's claims in his books. That just exactly how far back did Grace Smith start framing Allen? He claims he didn't even hear about Allen as a suspect till 1980, but there's some indications that there was a third person who was actively trying to frame Allen for being Zodiac way back, you know, in the early 70s. So other than Allen, and only a couple of people took Alan seriously as a Zodiac suspect. They never had a Zodiac suspect. There, it turns out, there were very good suspects in, in most of these murders. And in fact, the Benicia Police Department has always considered the, the first murder, the Faraday Jensen murder, they've always considered that murder solved. Riverside Police consider the Bates murder to be solved. And uh, I argued that the Vallejo Police Department pretty much solved the murder of Darlene Farron. Uh, there was a very, very good suspect and a very surprising suspect uh, in the attack at Lake Berryessa that Cecilia Shepard died and and uh, uh, Brian Hartnell lived. Um, uh, but and and I see indications that San Francisco police sort of kind of solved the Stein murder uh, in 1997. Uh, they had a suspect in a in an unrelated murder who who looks like a pretty good suspect for that shooting as well. So. It, I'm not saying I can prove who committed each of these murders, but there's in the files, and Grace Smith never mentioned any of these suspects, there were very solid suspects in each individual murder, but there was never a good suspect for all of the murders. Yeah. Did they ever arrest anybody? Or Well, there were arrests made, um, and some of the suspects were convicted of other murders. 
Um, it's really expensive to put someone on trial for murder, and especially when the mind of the public has been so confused. If you arrested somebody for any of these murders, uh, you'd hard, you know, there's so much misinformation. These highly publicized cases, it's almost impossible to get a reliable you know, jury verdict in these cases. And so if they could convict these guys of other murders, one of the, one of the top suspects in the Farron murder, uh, was, I mean, he was even indicted in absentia for another drug related murder. And, uh, but never, but he turned informant and worked as an informant for a couple of years. But then the cops he was working with in Vallejo got busted themselves for corruption. And so he eventually ended up going to prison on like just other drug related charges uh, in the late seventies. Um, so, uh, and there was one suspect, they just never, Riverside is pretty sure they know who murdered Sherry Joe Bates, but they just never had quite enough evidence to, to really get an ironclad case to get a, to get a conviction. So I'm not saying these guys are definitely guilty. What I'm saying is there were good suspects in each of these murders. None of them could be the Zodiac, uh, and great. And funny thing is Grace Smith had access to this, most of this information and, and never said a word about them. So. Yeah, a really unusual case. And and so one guy survived too, right? That uh, Mike Mijo? Well, a couple. Um, uh, Mike Mijo survived. Um, the poor, poor guy's pretty messed up. I mean, he doesn't even remember how many times he was shot. Uh, and then Brian Hartnell, the young man at Lake Berryessa, he survived. Pretty, you know, he's, obviously he's a little nervous, but um, but, but he, he recovered okay and became a, became a lawyer. Uh, he doesn't talk to the media very often. But um, so two... Two supposedly known victims uh, did survive, uh, pretty seriously wounded, but but they did survive. Yeah, so none of them were able to say anything about what happened to them or who did it or any sort of description, eh? Well, uh, there was some speculation that Mike Mageau knew a lot more about who shot him than he admitted to the police. And Darlene's uh, family have also said, uh, her sister and her brother have said, well, we weren't exactly honest with the police about what we were up to that night. Um, and, it, you know, and that happens a lot. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean Mike knows for sure. Um, the one suspect, one suspect was booked in that shooting, but he didn't match the physical description. The gun he had in his possession, which, and there's some, still some question about whether the ballistics matched. Uh, he had a P38, which is a uh, the Walter version of the Luger, and it was sent for comparison. We don't know what the results were. But he had a friend and part-time roommate uh, who did match the description of the killer. And when he was the night he was arrested, he said, well, this is not my gun. It belongs to somebody else. But he knew. when he, As soon as he was arrested, uh, and he, just, he went to this drug dealer's house, knocked on the door. The guy didn't answer the door. And he turned around to leave, and these two narcotics cops pick him up. And he and they search him and they find the P38 and he turns to his friend and says, I'm going to be booked for murder. And he was. He was immediately booked for the Farron murder. Um, we don't know exactly why he wasn't eventually charged and tried. It's probably because he did not fit the description. But uh, he had uh, a friend who did match a description and he said that the gun belonged to a friend of his, but he wouldn't give the name. Now, there's another suspect in the Farron murder. And what's really odd is... Um, he would actually make a pretty good suspect for being a Zodiac killer, somebody smart enough to do this, somebody who had honest-to-God code training, honest-to-God demolition training. Um, he was a former Green Beret. Uh, he was Darlene Farron's first husband, uh, Jim Phillips Crabtree, uh, and he was a dead ringer for the physical description that Mike gave of the shooter at Blue Rock Springs Park. Now, I'm not saying I can prove he was the killer, but the funny thing is the cops didn't even look for him. I mean, the first person you think of, and the detective in charge of the case, his first hunch was this was some kind of a romantic revenge shooting. And But they didn't even bother looking for Jim for six months after the murder. They got a tip from a psychic to look into Jim, and then they did, and you know they couldn't really find a lot of evidence. Um, but the funny thing is they didn't look at him very hard, and it took him six months to even go look for him. And he does perfectly match the description. It would give him a motive and things like that. I'm not saying that I think he, he, he did it, but it's just funny that, that there were suspects uh, in these murders that the cops kind of avoided looking at. Some of them were informants, people like that. And so that, that was part of the problem. Well, why do you think that they were avoiding or just not really? Were they just convinced of something themselves and they so they didn't look at anything that didn't fit? Well, in the... In the first, in the in the Faraday Jensen shooting, 
The kids' friends said that for the first few days, the investigators were really trying to find out. They, they thought it was drug-related. And it turned out that David and Betty Lou were totally clean-cut kids. They didn't even drink. So they started to get away from that angle. And then all of a sudden, there were two particular um, characters in Vallejo who, who were kind of came in their sights as suspects, and the investigation just stopped that day. And this can happen sometimes out of fear, and sometimes it happens because there's a guy from the narcotics squad who says, hey, that's, you know, we're, we got a case of our own going on here, and they just drop it. I mean, that, that happens all the time. Um, people don't understand that. That happens all the time. And what's interesting about that is the, the Solano County Narcotics Task Force had officers from each department. They're working together as teams. The Faraday, uh, or the, uh, the Jensen, or the, uh, the Farron Majot shooting, there were two undercover cops, members of this task force, uh, Ben Villarreal and Richard Hoffman. In their reports, they put themselves at the scene of the crime at the exact time of the shooting. But they both claimed they didn't see the victim's car there. And one of the best suspects in that shooting happens to be one of their informants. So what does that prove? I'm not exactly sure. I think if they'd been directly involved, I think they would have done a better job of covering their butts. Um, I think one possible thing that happened was they, one of them, either Mike or Darlene, uh, were working with them as informants, and Hoffman blunders his way into the parking lot, and somebody sees him there and puts two and two together and shoots Mike and Darlene because they jumped to the conclusion, right or wrong. Maybe it was a total coincidence, who knows. But they kind of jumped to the conclusion that that's what was going on. But there's good reasons to think that Mike was, I mean, he was dressed to commit burglaries that night, and, uh, Darlene's own brother has said, you know, well, she was out buying me a bag of weed and blah, 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 blah. Whether, we, whether that's true or not, it's impossible to prove at this point. But there's a connection between those first two shootings and a couple of undercover narcotics cops in Solano County. So, Yeah, so there's so, so, so many ways to go with it, you know. Well, the funny thing is those, those letters, if you have access to the files and the facts in these cases, the letters start coming in and they're making claims. Uh, I was there and I can tell you this and I can tell you that. If you follow up on the claims in the letters, they point directly at these suspects and the fact that these suspects aren't being arrested, which I thought was very interesting. Yeah. Uh, especially the two, the, two, the two shootings that took place in Solano County. I thought that was very interesting. Uh, what, what can you say about the letters? How did they start? And uh, they were going to, what, the Chronicle, I believe? Well, in uh, July 4th, the night of July 4th, uh, Mike and Darlene get shot in Blue Rock Springs Park, and uh, there's a suspect arrested the night of July 20th. And while he's being held, and he, they find a gun, a P-38, which would be the same type of weapon that was used in the shooting, and they send it off to the state crime lab for a ballistics check, and uh, we don't know what the results were, but the results came back around the 27th or 28th, and about that time... Uh, Mike Mijot is shown a stack of mug photos, um, whatever suspects they had in this case, and he, he doesn't recognize anybody. A couple days later, um, three newspapers, the San Francisco Chronicle, San Francisco Examiner, and they're owned by the same publisher at this time, and the Vallejo Times Herald. These are the three biggest papers in the Bay Area. They each receive a letter, and each letter contains one-third of the famous 408-character uh, cryptogram. And there's a demand that uh, the newspapers print this cryptogram on their front pages. Funny thing is, the letter writer didn't demand that the newspapers explain why they were publishing these cryptograms. It just, they did that on their own uh, hook. So uh, the letter claims he was responsible for these two unsolved shootings, which the media had already speculated there'd be a possible connection. Um, they were characterized as Lover's Lane shootings in the papers. That's not really true. The spot where uh, David and Betty Lou were shot was not a Lover's Lane by any stretch of the imagination. It was the parking lot of a, a water company pump house right along the highway between uh, Benicia and uh, Vallejo. Um, there was no privacy in that lot at all. And matter of fact, there were 
at least one car going by every five minutes, and these people all could see the kids sitting in the car. This is not a lover's lane. It was, however, known to be used by drug dealers, and the big-time traffickers would meet the little retail dealers in this parking lot. It was kind of a, it was a difficult spot for the cops to patrol on a regular basis, and you could see cars coming from either direction. So they would, you know, you get, you get in a lot more trouble if you have like five pounds of weed in your car. So they would break it up into the smaller quantities, and the retail guys would drive on into town on the edge of Vallejo, there's Blue Rock Springs Park. And you have, at that time, the parking lot was a lot darker and a little bit more remote. Some people did use that parking lot as a lover's lane, but the night that Mike and Darlene get shot, you have cars in and out of the lot, in and out of the lot, in and out of the lot, and none of them, not one of those cars is there on a date. Um, except maybe one. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, they're not really, they're not really lover's lanes. But this was how the media had portrayed it. So the letter takes credit for the two shootings and claims, he said, I will state certain facts which only I and the police know. Well, if you follow up on those facts in those police reports, he gets some of the facts right, that's true, and some of them had already been published in the newspapers. Um, but that kind of gives us a clue as to which newspapers he was reading. Some of them are wrong. Some of those facts are just plain wrong. But he thought they, apparently he thought they were right. And then some of the things he states are actually facts which would not have been known by the killer. He, uh, he especially refers to suspects in some of these letters that could not have been known to the killer. So that was a, that was a really surprising thing I, I, I discovered when I compared these letters and newspaper clippings to the actual police department files. But at the time, there's, there are police officers like the chief of police in Vallejo, Jack Stiltz, um, they did publicly say we we don't believe this guy. We we're not we're not convinced by these letters, but more or less the media pretty much take the stand that these letters are confirmed by the facts in the cases, and then they're not. Um, so this letter, you know, this obviously generates a lot of publicity. Um, two readers to uh, do solve the 408 cryptogram to, the, to everyone's satisfaction. The funny thing is, the nature of the cryptogram. It, it wouldn't hold up as evidence in court because the way he used multiple substitutions for different letters of the alphabet. Um, for example, the letter might act, the cryptogram might actually say, uh, I enjoy kissing people because it's so much fun, right? Not killing. It could actually say kissing because man is the most dangerous animal of all to kiss. Uh, I'm not uh, staking my entire reputation on that uh, decoding, but it's possible that that's what it says. But the newspapers all subscribe to the theory these are actually from the killer, no doubt about it, confirmed by police. And that's the impression that the public gets. Yeah. And this really makes it a national news story. I mean, this really, and this is a really big lucky break for the San Francisco Chronicle. They have a story that's just as big as the Boston Strangler, and it drops right into their laps as soon as the movie stops playing in the theaters. How do you think they knew those letters were, like they were, they were, you know, they were, they were in a crypt, right? So they, they weren't really easy. They, I, I'm just trying to figure out, because back then things were not like they are now. So the letter would just go to the newspaper, and how would they kind of really know it was real? Or Well, it, there's, no, there's no reliable story about, about how the newspapers responded when they opened these envelopes. Um, and it's clear the, 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 the letter writer demanded action by the end of the day, Friday, but of August 1st. But he didn't mail the letters till the afternoon of the 31st. And the morning papers would never have had time to, to respond to these letters. So did he know that? Is that also a clue these letters were a hoax? Or was it just a mistake on his part? He seemed to know an awful lot about the newspaper business, and not just as a reporter, but really as a publisher. And he never, for example, he never asked the newspapers to do anything illegal, which is odd. Um, he never asked them to obstruct justice or do anything that would, it's just like he knew what the procedures were. And another interesting thing is the Vallejo Times Herald uh, filed charges against this unknown person uh, for attempted extortion. I mean, he's making threats of moral violence uh, while he's demanding uh, publicity on their front pages. The other newspapers didn't. But the Vallejo Times Herald did, and the funny thing is, he never wrote another letter to the Vallejo Times Herald. How did he know they'd filed a, a complaint? 
Oh, so so you, think, you think he was part of the newspaper somehow? Well, the more, if you want to jump ahead to my conclusions, the more I compare, the more letters come in, and the more newspaper articles are written, and the more police reports are written. Um, Trace, you know, some of his facts are wrong. He, some things he thinks are right, and they're not right. You can trace them to very specific sources, very specific pages in certain police department reports. And not only the person writing the letters, there's a reporter at the Chronicle who has access to certain reports. And by making a list of the people who would have received these reports and had access to them, at the time it would, they'd had the, right, there's a certain window of time when the letters are written, you come up with a very short list of suspects and it came up with two people. Um, one person in Napa and one person in San Francisco. And one of those two people also happened to have handwriting identical to the handwriting on the Zodiac letters. So, so who were they? Well, uh, there's a reporter at the Chronicle, and uh, assuming he, some of his articles don't have bylines, but assuming it's the same reporter, that would be Keith Power. And that includes uh, actual actual evidence tampering in the Stein case, where he he not only picked up Stein's uh, trip sheet, but also would have had plenty of opportunity to grab a couple pieces of his shirt and use them to write Zodiac letters. And the other person is a Napa County deputy sheriff named Hal Snoke, who or some you could pronounce it Snoke. It's spelled S N O O K. As far as I know, the correct pronunciation is Snoke. But he um, very remarkable fellow. And he ran Napa's crime lab, and he happened to be on a very short list of people who was receiving. There's this myth that there was no cooperation between police departments. Even before they thought there was any connection between these murders, they were doing an excellent job of sharing what information they had. And one of the people who was receiving copies of these reports happened to be Hal Snook, because he ran the crime lab in Napa. And there's also connections between him and some of the suspects. Uh, he was very heavily involved in, you know, in, when you watch them. And uh, Dennis Hopper, uh, they're, what you're seeing is these these Hell's Angels who are running methamphetamine from Mendocino County down into the Bay Area, and they come through Napa and they come through Vallejo. And so Hal Snook was very involved in trying to put a stop to this. He was up to his eyeballs on it at the time. And these guys were pretty violent. They were committing a lot of shootings. And he testified against a lot of these guys. And he was a real expert, and he's a founding member and a real driving force behind the California, what's it called, the California Narcotics Officers Association or something. Um, he's real big into this. So he would have known, and he would have known about these suspects in the two shootings in, in Solano County who were not being fully investigated. So he not only had access to the, the exact pages from the reports that the Zodiac killer used to write his letters, he also would have known about some of these suspects maybe not being investigated fully. And I, and I think that was his motive for participating in the hoax. Was And, and same for Keith Power. Um, I don't think it was a cheap publicity stunt. I don't think it was a joke. I think they were actually trying to call attention to this problem without, you know, if they come forward publicly, they they and their families would, would be in pretty serious danger. Um, so I, I think this was their way of trying to call attention to this problem. And that, I think that's how it started. So they had no way of, of testing the letters, I guess. There's, like, fingerprints. They found lots of fingerprints on the letters. Some of them undoubtedly belong to people at the Chronicle, especially when they first start coming in and, you know, you don't know. You get crank letters all the time. Um, so at first, the first couple of letters actually had quite a, quite a few fingerprints. There were, in fact, fingerprints found uh, uh, on uh, Darlene Fern's passenger car door handle. There were fingerprints found all over the passenger door of Brian's car at Lake Berryessa. There were a lot of fingerprints from a lot of crime scenes and a lot of fingerprints uh, from Paul Stein's cab. Now, there was a Napa, uh, the undersheriff, the, the second-in-command Napa Sheriff's Department, not, not real well-trained, but he'd been there for a long time. He gave a press conference where he announced that, he said, preliminary analysis appears to match some of these fingerprints from all three crime scenes. And to uh, possibly to one of the letters. So, a couple of days later, they get the they get the actual reports back from the FBI that says no, there's there is no match between any of these prints. So why why did he say that? That's that's an interesting because the only person who really could have told him there was a match would be would have been Hal Snook. Hal Snook would have been the only person in a position to tell uh, Tom Johnson. Yeah, well, I think we found a possible match between all these prints. But it turns out 
lots of prints from several crime scenes and several letters, and none of them match. None of them. It doesn't prove the negative, but it certainly absolutely fails to prove the positive. Right. So what do you think, what's your opinion on the letters? So they've come from several people or just one or two or like, what was your thought? The handwriting is very distinctive in, in some funny ways. And um, when you look, and it depends on which copies you look at, a lot of the handwriting experts at the time who were spouting off opinions were not looking at the original letters. They were looking at just plain old Xerox copies. And there's a lot of the a lot of details about the strokes used because he he all the letters were written with a blue felt tip pen, and that interested me because uh, some of my previous experience forgers you know your first clue that a signature is a forgery is they use a felt tip pen. Um, they don't have a lot of confidence in their strokes, but he used felt tip pens. In the process of looking for fingerprints, they they sprayed these letters with a, a solution called an anhydrin, which would chemically cause the fingerprints to show up, but it caused the ink to run. And that's interesting because you can get a lot of information about where he starts a stroke and where he stops a stroke and if he hesitates, if he lifts the pen. Um, you get a lot of information that way. And looking at the, the first three letters that we have these, uh, people over the years have made high-resolution uh, high color scans or photos. You can see this information. It looked to me as though, and it was pretty obvious, that the person writing the Zodiac letters had done a few things to disguise his handprinting. One was to rotate the paper about 90 degrees counterclockwise uh, to create an exaggerated rightward slant in his handwriting. The second thing he did was he actually rotated the paper 180 degrees and drew certain letters upside down, the lowercase b and the lowercase d and the lowercase p and the lowercase g, lowercase y and lowercase h. And you can, you can see this in the strokes. And maybe I'm right about that, maybe I'm wrong. But the funny thing is, after the Stein shooting, when we start getting letters that seems like the personality changes and the purpose of writing the letters changes, you notice those, those strokes are reversed. Whoever's writing those letters started out by rotating the paper and drawing certain letters of the alphabet, and then they stopped doing it. Now, maybe it's the same person stopped doing it, but that's a pretty big clue. In addition to the fact that personality changes, he's no longer making any credible claims about any connection to any murders. He's not, he's not sticking his nose in any real murder investigations. And, and the personality changes, these are long, rambling letters, making create, right, he writes to Melvin Belli, things like this. So there are a lot of clues that whoever wrote the first three or four letters stopped. And there's a reason we can see why he probably stopped. And then you see somebody else taking over writing the letters. Why do you think someone else took over writing the letters? Did they, they were associated or just someone else wanted to do it because they were... Well, the, this was a huge story for the Chronicle. Huge. And it appears uh, after the cab driver was shot in October of 69, there was a big conference of all the different law enforcement agencies on October 20th. And either that next letter or... That's when you see the handwriting change, see the person, right? It looks like a completely different person takes over writing the letters. And I don't think that's a coincidence because, ironically, Hal Snook would have been one of the participants at this conference. So either he admitted what he did, and the second thing is Keith Power, who had, Paul Avery was not the original reporter on the Zodiac story. He'd actually written a couple of stories kind of questioning the credibility of the Zodiac letters. After this conference, I mean, literally within a couple of days of the conference, Keith Power never wrote another article about Zodiac ever again. And Paul Avery takes over as Zodiac's publicist. So something changed as a result of that law enforcement conference of October 20th. Huh. And I think that it, the Chronicle just really had a vested interest in keeping the letters coming. And, and, and you know, pretty strongly, two people, pretty strong suspects for doing that. One's Paul Avery, and actually, it turns out, for a lot of reasons, and there's going to be a whole other book about this, the most fingers point directly at Robert Graysmith as being the person who just kept writing Zodiac letters. Wow. And so, well, what made people follow the, like, was there true accuracy to what they were saying in the letters? Some. Um, some of the facts were true, but what's interesting is they tend to come, like I said, there was a Chronicle reporter who undoubtedly had access. For example, 
Richard Hoffman, the undercover narcotics officer I mentioned, who happened, in his own report, he puts himself at the scene of the crime at the time of the shooting um, and may have been part of the reason why there was a shooting. He was the only Vallejo officer to type his report the night of the shooting. Uh, in the early morning hours of July 5th, he typed his report, went home. That day, a Chronicle reporter got a copy of that report, either physically or somebody read it to him over the phone, because he wrote an article, and his article is kind of unique of all the newspaper articles that week. He wrote an article that's based exclusively and extensively on Hoffman's report. Now, interestingly, those first two Zodiac letters he seems to have also had a copy of that report because he's correcting the one or two things that the Chronicle reporter not only got wrong, but he also he imitates 13 unique spelling errors that Hoffman makes in his report. And he kind of repeats those in his letters. Wow. And that's a pretty that's pretty compelling that both the Chronicle reporter and the so-called Zodiac killer their source of information that week happened to be uh, Hoffman's report. <laughs> yeah. So um, were they trying to frame Hoffman? Hoffman has said a few things over the years that also tend to make him look guilty. I just think that if he were guilty of participating in the shooting, I think he would have done a much better job of, of covering his tracks. Um, that's one reason I don't suspect him. But... Uh, you know, it's, and he was the one who rode with the victims in the ambulance, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of people have suspected him of being involved in the shooting. I'm not so sure about that. There's no doubt whatsoever that a Chronicle reporter, that, that story had no byline. A Chronicle reporter and the guy writing the Zodiac Killer List, they both had a copy of Hoffman's report. I don't, I don't see any doubt about that whatsoever. It's and just, how did this happen? Yeah, it's just how they got it. Yeah. So are you thinking that... Uh so do they have that whoever wrote the letter must have had access to the police info then right and that would include reporters uh, it was really common in those days for one way reporters got information was they would type officers reports for them now the Vallejo Police Department they all sat down and typed their reports on July 8th uh, for a couple of reasons one they were getting ready to go out on strike they want to get caught up on their paperwork uh, a newspaper article had already appeared in the Vallejo Times Herald with this there's a there's a supposedly there was a phone call. Supposedly the killer called Vallejo Police Department the night of the shooting, uh, right, and told them all about it. it. But that version of the phone call changes. So Sunday night, Sunday night, July, the night of July seventh, the excuse me, the Times Herald, uh, no, the News Chronicle, the afternoon paper, they published a different version of the phone call, the one that we're familiar with, the official version of the phone call. I want to report a double murder. If you will go one mile east on Columbus Parkway, you'll find the kids uh, to the public park. You'll find the kids in a brown car. I also killed those kids last year. Goodbye. That's the official version. Well, that appeared in the newspapers before it shows up in the Vallejo police reports. Nancy Slover didn't sit down and type up a report about that until the morning after the paper came out. So that kind of raises a question right there. And even in her report, she says, you know, the substance of what he said was blah, blah, blah. Well, it's a direct, it's a perfect quote from the version that already appeared in the newspaper. Where did that reporter get the version? We don't know. There was a, there's a different version of the phone call the, the couple of days earlier in, being reported in the newspapers. And once again, you know, there's also a lot of doubt about, about that phone call. Um, but, but basically... Uh, one way a person could have gotten access to those reports is by being a reporter, uh, typing up reports. Um, it also appears that there is a, um, a a reporter in Vallejo named Dave Peterson, and he always had he had great sources. He had a really deep source in the San Francisco FBI office. Dave Peterson was a, a great investigative reporter. He apparently had access to certain pages. Some of his stories seem like they're quoted verbatim from certain Vallejo police reports as well. Um, but it's mainly it's mainly the Chronicle reporter that that keeps showing up over and over again as having unusual access to <laughs> to these investigations. But you know, they, they, there was things often wrong in the in the letters too, right? Right. But the funny thing is, you can trace those errors to certain pages of the reports that the information is erroneous in the reports, and that's interesting. Yeah, I thought that was very interesting. Well, that definitely ties a connection then, right? It sure adds a lot of 
you know, and then, so when it became obvious to me that the letters were probably a hoax, I made a list of the people who could have done it, and one of them turns out to have handwriting identical to Zodiac's. And for example, what's funny is if you take the Zodiac letters and you rotate those, those letters of the alphabet 180 degrees, those match up, that fills in all the blanks, that's, that matches up exactly with this guy's handwriting. Wow. So I thought that was, you know, and other, there are other idiosyncrasies about his handwriting, which are, they just look identical. And I've had it, you know, cost about $2,500 to have a court certified QDE look at something. But I've had a few contact me, contact me and say, oh, I, I can see where you've gone off the tracks, you know, very condescending emails and saying, send me your, your stuff and I'll look it over and show you where, where you went wrong. And I send them the stuff and I never hear from them ever again. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so uh, have I gotten official confirmation? No, but I've gotten, a, you know, some pretty good hints that I, I'm, and you can see this with the naked eye. I mean, in handwriting analysis, is, there's nothing scientific about it anyway. But you can look at this stuff, and I think, you know, you can see, go to my website and see it. I don't, I don't think there's much doubt at all. And this guy not only had access to these reports at the time the letters were written, but I think he had a pretty good motive for, for trying to do this, so... What do you think? He also name? knew. Well, he also knew. This guy was a veteran from World War II. There's this in the cryptogram. He, the motive supposedly is the blank I have killed will become my slaves in the afterlife. Well, this that that supposedly goes back to these Tad Ted cults on certain South Pacific islands like Mindanao and New Guinea and places like this. This guy was a World War II veteran of the jungle fighting in New Guinea and Mindanao. So he would have known about those cults. And the knife that was used at Lake Berryessa, the way it's described, sounds like a homemade bolo knife. Or it might have even been a war souvenir bolo knife uh, from Mindanao. So there are a lot of, lot of connections between this guy. And, and, and I, I'm still waiting on, you know, I, I like to confirm things before I publicize them. But this, what's really weird is um, in Gray Smith's book, Zodiac, 1986, every cop who sneezed on a piece of paper related to the Zodiac case, gets his name in Gray Smith's book. Even the guy at, at the San Francisco uh, coroner's office where they, where they had the evidence room, the guy who signed in the evidence from the Stein case, George Schultz, his name is in Gray Smith's book. And that's all, all he did was just sign for the evidence that was turned into the evidence locker. His name is in Gray Smith's book. There are two names that are glaringly absent from Gray Smith's book, Hal Snook and Keith Power. And in fact, Gray Smith actually lies about who's writing what newspaper articles. He also he he plagiarizes quite a bit. Um, he will uh, claim to have interviewed a witness, and it's actually that that section of the book is actually plagiarized from a newspaper article. Um, but but he just flat out lies about who's writing what stories. Uh, uh, at the time that Keith Power was the one who was coming up with this stuff, so I, that's another pretty big clue. Why would Gray Smith leave their names out of his book? Especially when it turns out that he had known Hal Snook for like a really long... They go way back, apparently. I, I'm still trying to confirm this ironclad once and for all, but apparently they went way back, so... Yeah. Well, what was, uh, what was uh, uh, Robert Gray Smith, what was, his, what was his connection to all this then? Well, there, like I, he, he's an interesting character. And uh, he was not totally honest. Uh, first of all, he changed his name. He changed his name in '76. His first, the first time he tried to publish a book about Zodiac, he changed his name. His actual name is Robert Smith Jr. His dad was a colonel in the Air Force, and he spent quite a few years in Japan. And uh, when he was 12 years old, he got his first job at a newspaper as an illustrator and working in the darkroom stuff like that. Um, the the, the Tachikawa Marauder, which was a uh, one of the, part of the Stars and Stripes. Uh, newspaper network and uh, that's pretty impressive yeah um and one of the big questions is where did he get the skills um to, to get a job like that when he's 12 and he worked at newspapers all his life even while he was going to college he got his degree uh in oakland and he worked at the oakland tribune for four years and then after uh he went from there to the chronicle and um he'd always he didn't he wasn't just a cartoonist um, you don't make full-time pay drawing a cartoon for one newspaper. Even if you're syndicated, it's hard to make full-time pay. He worked in the darkroom. He worked in what newspapers call the production department, what they used to call the production department. They would get you get the ad copy and illustrations, and you get the the photographs from the dark from the reporters and from the from the photographers, 
and you would get the like comic strips and things like that. And they're put together, uh, and you use a special camera called a stat camera, a static camera, which uses lithographic film and has a non-distorting lens. So you lay this, all this stuff out on the table, you assemble the pieces, you photograph it, it turns it into a pure black and white image, or you can you you know keep screens, or whatever. I don't know. But that was his job, and um, he never told anybody that. So when the letters were coming, for example, when these letters are coming into the Chronicle, Graysmith is the one who's photographing them. And they always came in when he was working. No letter ever came into the Chronicle on Graysmith's day off. They were mailed on his days off, um, all the letters. And so he, why would he like not tell people everything about his job? And in his own book, he come, right, he, there's, a, there's a suspicion that, like, how did Zodiac, disguise his handwriting and Graysmith comes up with this explanation for how you can copy Zodiac handwriting. If you look at the letters themselves, because the time he wrote his book there were no photocopies of the letters available, you, you can see like that's not what Zodiac did. He didn't trace the letters from a master alphabet. If you, you actually put the letters on top of each other, especially the first few letters, that's not how it was done. But, but his method for it is how he could have done it. There are an awful lot. Of, there are lots and lots and lots of clues that point towards Graysmith at least writing the belly letter. Um, and he makes a lot of claims about the belly letter that he cut out of his book, things like that. So it's he himself is pretty suspicious, and and he's told so many lies over the years. And his frame around Arthur Lee Allen is just such a pile of crap. You know, he's already been exposed for that. In his other true crime books he's written have, have all been thoroughly debunked. So, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do you think brought him into this whole thing? Like, the question, it... my, my only question is, just exactly when did he, and, and, and it's perfectly clear, it's perfectly clear when he wrote the book Zodiac, he, he told a lot of lies. He told lies about Arthur Lee Allen. But he, he tells lies about the authenticity of the letters. And, it, and page after page of his book, it's p perfectly clear he had access to these files. And he simply lies about their contents. And one of the things he lies about is the authenticity of the letters. And why would he do that unless he knew they were a hoax? And my only, in, in, in his story about how he got involved in writing it, like when you watch the movie, Fincher movie, it's a very entertaining movie, but the story of how Gray Smith gets involved it becomes obvious that that's not true either. He'd been involved in it much earlier than he'd claimed. Um, my only question is, just exactly when did he start? Was he in on it from the very beginning, or was it did he just kind of steal the idea and run off with it? That's my only question. Yeah. Um, other people, but I encourage other people, you know, you don't have to take my word for any of this. You can read this material for yourself. Um, it's all available. You get it from my website. My on my website, it's been organized. It's been collated. The missing pages are pointed out. Um, but you can get it from from a lot of different places and just read it for yourself. Yeah, yeah. We're going to actually connect that. We'll put that on ours, and we're going to put that also on the uh, Facebook for everybody uh, to look at. That's a really interesting part. So, and then the the, the final the, the version of the one book that you can buy now. It's only ninety nine cents. In in two thousand. Uh, uh, into 2011, getting into 2012, word kind of leaked out. And um, there was also a rumor going around that these guys in Napa were going to arrest this suspect. So I ended up sending law enforcement what I had at the time. And at that time, there was not Hal Snook. There was a, another deputy sheriff, Ray Land. I, there was some confusion about whose handwriting this was. It looked like Ray Land's handwriting. And one of the secrets was, one of the missing pages indicates that he's the one who found Brian Hartnell's car at Lake Berryessa and discovered the graffito on the car. So if anyone besides the killer had done that, then it would be, you know, probably be Ray Land. Well, so at that time, I, I just sent them a copy of the, what I had to, to date and then ended up publishing that for 99 cents on the Kindle. That's the version that's still up there. I haven't finished the actual final detailed version of that book. But if you if you buy the book now, you'll get a email and a coupon from Amazon when the f final edition comes out. You'll be able, you'll get a discount for that. Um, uh, so, but it's still a good place to start if you want to read these documents for yourself. 
And, you know, and again, as new facts come to light, and it, and it came to my attention, somebody came up with a, a different copy of that handwriting that had the actual signature on it. It's Hal Snook, um, which explains a lot. It turns out Ray Land and his brother Dennis Land were actually murder suspects um, in the murder of Cecilia Shepard. Um, and Dennis Land makes a pretty good suspect in some other stabbing murders in that area at that time. I'm not saying I can prove 100% he was guilty, uh, but that was kind of surprising. And, and he and Hal Snook also go back quite a ways, which is interesting. I mean, there is the theory, you know, why, why write these letters? One theory is, is to give someone an alibi for at least one of the murders. I, I admit that that's possible. Um, I don't think the evidence really adds up to that, but that's possible. Um, yeah. And there was no really, was there any other evidence that tied the murders together other than the letters? There is no evidence of any kind that ties the murders together. Not weapon, not, not MO. The MOs are actually quite a bit different. Um, the guy who did the shooting on Lake Herman Road obviously had killed people before. Um, the shooting at Blue Rock Springs Park was a lot sloppier. Um, different weapon used, different weapon used every time. There was a conclusion, uh, the media had reported that the same weapon was used to shoot Stein that had been used at Blue Rock Springs Park. Turned out it was a completely different type of 9mm pistol. Um, so, in reality, there was no evidence linking these murders of any kind. The witness descriptions actually are much different. Graysmith kind of fudges them and sometimes flat out lies about them to make it sound like they're describing the same guy. They're not. Um, the famous... The famous uh, Fook memo describes a suspect who couldn't possibly have been the person who shot Stein. He was 50, 60 pounds heavier, a couple inches taller, and 20 years older. And his hair, he had blonde hair instead of brown hair. So it couldn't possibly be the same guy. But Greysmith makes it sound like the descriptions match, and they don't. It's just things that you find out from reading these reports that there's really... There's no evidence of a connection between the murders. There's a lot of evidence collected Graysmith doesn't tell us about, and they all point, you know, they completely fail to make a match of any kind. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.